this uh, other course that will focus more specifically on environmental uh, approaches for um, uh, supporting mountain farming system. And I will uh, focus my presentation on one agri-environmental measures, which was uh, tested in France. Uh, it started actually in 2007 as a pilot uh, measure. Uh, which is what we call a result-oriented uh, agro-environmental measure. And then it was, uh, it's still continuing so far, although it has changed a bit. So I will uh, explain you why it was considered as uh, innovative. I think the, this lecture is a, a bit more complicated than the one of uh, Tuesday. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to interrupt and to ask. Uh, especially at the beginning, I will explain a few things about agro-environmental measure. If you are not so familiar with this agro-environmental policy, don't hesitate to uh, ask questions, not to get lost on the way. <laughs> so um, I will first uh, say a few general things about uh, the second pillar of the common agricultural policy and this agro-environmental measure. Then I will present you this uh, measure that was tested in France in 2007, which we call the flowering meadows uh, measure. I will uh, give you some uh, more uh, insight about the farmer perception of the measure. And then I will go to a kind of side uh, side action that was put in place in France related to the measure, which is the flowering meadow contest, or uh, in French we call it concours, prairie fleurie, a kind of competition. And then uh, I will we, I will finish with some uh, more general uh, ideas uh, about things to take up for uh, future policy design. So first of all, a few things about the common agricultural policy. I don't know if you are at all familiar with this policy or not. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so actually it's a very uh, important policy in the European Union. It's a really large part of the budget. It was uh, created, uh, it was one of the first policy created by the European Union and it was really meant to support the agricultural uh, sector um, because at, at, uh, when after the Second World War there was a huge uh, issue with uh, uh, Europe self-sufficiency, so the policymaker wanted to make sure that Europe would produce enough uh, food, so there was this, this strong policy to support the agricultural sector. Uh, nowadays, the common agricultural policy is organized in uh, two pillars. Um, so this was the general scheme for the 2014-2020 programming period because the CAP has uh, usually a six-year programming period and then we change to a new model, a new policy. Uh, and actually, this one uh, had delay, so it, until now it's still this uh, framework that is uh, running and from next year onward we will get the new, uh, the new uh, scheme, let's say. So, to, to tell you, there are two, two pillars. The first one is meant to be uh, uh, support to, um, to the farmer revenue, actually. Um, and it's made of direct payment, which uh, historically were based uh, on, uh, on production. And the second pillar is more... Uh, pillar for supporting rural development. Um, and in, uh, in France, as in Italy at the moment, the second pillar is uh, ma managed by the regions uh, and it's a co-finance, um, it's co-finance measure, so the two co-financers are, are the regions and the European Union. <laughs> So what I will, the measure I will talk about today, the flowering meadow measure, is a measure from the second pillar. So this second pillar has uh, 
slightly different uh, objectives compared to the first one. I was telling you the first one is really meant to support farmer uh, revenue. And the second one is, um, is more to have, uh, let's say, uh, rural development action, agri-environmental action, for instance. So here I just uh, copied the, um, the priorities which have been uh, announced, let's say, by the EU in institution uh, about this, the purpose of the second pillar. So it says um, fostering uh, competitiveness, ensuring sustainable management of natural resources and climate action, because climate change has become a, a very important issue and uh, achieved a balanced territorial development, including creation and maintenance of employment. So as you can see, the management of natural resources is one of the three uh, main objectives. And that's why uh, the, what we call agri-environmental schemes or measures are part of this uh, second pillar. Uh, in the second pillar, there are more things than just the agri-environmental measure, but agri-environmental measures are part of this uh, second pillar. Um, why did we, uh, did we uh, come up with agri-environmental measure, measures? Well, because the, there have been for many years now uh, criticism about the side effect of uh, uh, agricultural production and the impact of agriculture on the uh, environment. Uh, for various reasons, water pollution problems, biodiversity, uh, decline, etc. So, uh, of course, this, um, uh, let's say, negative impact of agriculture depends on uh, the practices and on the type of farming system. But the, the, the idea behind this agro-environmental measure is to offer uh, financial support to, and to give incentive to farmers to have more environmental friendly practices. Um, so the, um, these agro-environmental measures are actually contracts that uh, the farmers can uh, subscribe to. And if they subscribe to such uh, measure, they have to fulfill a number of things. And to compensate that, they, sh they get a financial compensation for the efforts, let's say, they do to have uh, more sustainable practices. So the, it's a five-year uh, contract, and it gives uh, financial support uh, to farmers based on the principle of compensating the farmer for the extra cost or for the income for, foregone. As you might know, uh, the support, the financial support that that are given to farmers in the EU, have uh, are quite strictly controlled because you cannot uh, uh, support farmers as you as you want you have to respect the rules uh, from the world trade organization so the the rule that is um, in place in the eu to justify uh, fin such financial support to farmer is that uh, you have to compensate for the extra cost or for the income foregone so for each uh, measure that is proposed to the farmer they calculate what is the income foregone for uh, so the, the income that the farmer doesn't get because he has implemented this or that practices or what are the extra costs that he has to face <coughs> because he has implemented this or that practices. And actually in the EU, there are two uh, types of agro-environmental measure, and it's there that you have to tell me if it's not clear, because it's really important you get these points uh, before getting to the rest of the presentation. So um, there, the two types of measure are what we call uh, action-oriented measure or result-oriented measure. Um, action, what are action-oriented measure? Or oh, sometimes in the literature you can also find the term uh, means-oriented measure. I will uh, rather use action-oriented measure. It's, it targets specific action or specific means of action which are usually farming practices that the farmer 
commits to uh, to respect, to fulfill, to implement on his uh, plots, on his parcel of land. So, for instance, it can be uh, for a grassland. It can be a late mowing uh, agro-environmental measure. It means that the farmer is not allowed to cut the grass and to harvest the hay before, uh, for instance, uh, the 14th of July. So if the farmer subscribes to this measure, he is not free of the date he can harvest his uh, hay. He cannot do it in June if he has subscribed the measure that says not before the 14th of July. Uh, the Yeah, if he has contracted this measure, even if the weather uh, uh, is, for instance, if there is, a, as this summer, we had a huge drought, and he sees that actually uh, on the 30th of June, the, the grass is already uh, getting really dry, and he should actually harvest in June because the forage quality will really decrease. He cannot do it if he has subscribed the measure late mowing and not before 14th of July. Yeah. Well, otherwise he, he might get uh, lose the money if he gets control. But he, he has to respect it, yeah. Um, so that was one example with the uh, meadow. Uh, it can be also a restriction about the fertilization quantity, the fertilizer quantity that he can use on the parcel. Uh, so for instance, he can subscribe to a measure of not more than 100 units of nitrogen per hectare. Uh, and then he's not allowed to uh, apply more than that. So these are uh, action-oriented measures in the sense that the farmer engaged to uh, respect one specific action, one specific practice. And the second type of uh, measure is what we call uh, result-oriented measure, or in the literature you can also find sometimes outcome-oriented measure, or performance-oriented measure, or payment by result. And there, the farmers do not commit to respect a certain practice, but he commits to achieve a certain result. So it's not uh, action-oriented. He's more free to uh, implement the farming practices that he wishes to, impl to implement, but he's, he commits to achieve a certain result in the, in the plot. Uh, so it gives him uh, more flexibility and uh, what will be checked is whether he has achieved the result or not. So for instance, an example of, um, of such measure for biodiversity can be, as for the flowering meadow measure, to have a certain level of biodiversity in the, in the field. So we don't look at the uh, mowing date, we don't look at uh, how the farmers manage the meadow, we just look if he has achieved a certain level of biodiversity. For water quality uh, measure, it, it can be uh, another example on water quality <laughs> rather than on biodiversity, uh, can be that the nitrate concentration below the, the roots uh, do not exceed a certain uh, threshold, a certain limit. So we don't use, uh, about, we don't look in this case at the quantity of fertilizer that are applied by the farmer or at the fertilization date. We just look what is the nitrate content in the subwater. Uh, other uh, 
it's the same actually. It's the same that do the um, common agricultural policy uh, control. In France, there is one agency which is a public agency which is in charge of controlling uh, farmers for the common agricultural policy uh, payment. And uh, it's the same agent that is uh, supposed to be able to control both uh, action oriented measure or result oriented measure. And uh, this is for the control. And, um, and I will get back to that later in the presentation. Uh, you can also have a farming advisor, farmer advisor, like uh, agronomist uh, advising farmers uh, that can uh, help the farmer to know whether he should subscribe to such measure or not. But this is about advice, not about control. Those are two different uh, things. But indeed, it's, uh, having such measure really poses question about the competencies of the of this agent be they the one for control or the one for advice because as we will see indeed you need to be more uh, skilled i i would say to check uh, the second type than the first one so is it clear for you this distinction between action oriented and result oriented so um, actually, most of the measures uh, that are implemented uh, in the question, yeah. Uh, no, I meant um, I meant that it's more difficult to check uh, to control the second type of measure, the result-oriented one, than the first one, usually. Technically. Technically, Technically. yeah. Yes, because, uh, for instance, we will get back to that later, but if you are in this case of the biodiversity, and the result is uh, having in the field a certain level of biodiversity, you need to have people able to uh, assess the level of biodiversity uh, in the field, and uh, it's more difficult than, for instance, checking the late mowing uh, measure, because the late mowing, the controller just has to come on the, I don't know, on the 13th of July, if we take the, the example of the 14th, and you can easily see whether the meadows are already been harvested once or not, but assessing the level of biodiversity requires to have some biodiversity knowledge and Yes, I will. Uh, I will explain that just later, with this uh, with this specific measure. But it's uh, actually they made it quite easy. Um, so yes, uh, in fact, uh, so we have those two types of measures that exist in uh, in the European Union. But most of the agro-environmental measures actually implemented are uh, the action-oriented one, and the result-oriented ones are are not so common, and uh, they are uh, um, let's say pretty new and uh, less developed. But actually, they have been. Um, there have been many, many uh, studies, uh, research, and discussion about the impact of agri-environmental measure because it's an important tool of the second pillar of the common agricultural policy. And there are a lot of criticism about uh, this measure and, and about their impact. There are a lot of discussion because uh, some uh, stakeholders, some scientists, some experts uh, consider that uh, many of the agro-environmental measures uh, do not have uh, uh, sufficient impact, that their, their efficiency and their efficiency is, uh, is being questioned. And um, they are, um, the, the main criticism are the fact that uh, sometimes the measures are totally inadapted to local condition, to local context, uh, and that they are inadapted to farmer constraints. If we take the example, and your question was really relevant, uh, if we take this, the example of this late mowing uh, measure, 
uh, it is not adapted to uh, the weather condition. It might not be adapted to the weather condition of a specific uh, year. And there is no flexibility in that the measure is as it is, and you cannot changing, change it during the year, for instance. And you don't need to the same uh, date uh, for a uh, big error? For yes. For the more... Yes. Yeah. And Usually, at no least. Problem. Yes. Yes, it's not uh, not necessarily um, regionally adapted, for instance. Yeah. Yes, actually, uh, now we are in the, it's about to, to finish, but we are in the discussion, we were for several years now in the discussion about the new common agricultural policy, which is supposed to start uh, next year. And um, each member state had to write down uh, which measure he is planning to open in the sense to offer to farmers and uh, each country had to write uh, this um, national strategic plan we, we, it's called which is the document where they state what they are planning to do and then the commission uh, checks it uh, make feedback to the member state they might have to adjust it and then it's approved and it uh, and it enters into force and uh, in France, in the previous programming period, the, each, there was a, a national catalogue of measures, and then each region could pick up in this national catalogue the measure that they would propose in their region. Uh, it's because we had some changes in the administrative organization in France. Now it's really, it was really each region that were uh, drafting the, its, uh, its regional uh, program of measure. But yeah, it's not the European Union that is imposing uh, you will open this and that measure. So yeah, there are a lot of uh, criticism about the, the efficiency or the, the inefficiency of this measure and that there are criticism about the way they are designed and um, and result oriented measure were considered as a, a potential alternative to this uh, to this action oriented measure to overcome so, some limitation and uh, related to the fact that action or get, uh, oriented measures are uh, somehow not so uh, flexible. So I will now uh, tell you a bit more about this flowering meadow measure, which was uh, tested in France uh, from 2007 onwards. Um, so it's, uh, it's considered it was considered as, uh, as being uh, really new because based on this uh, result-oriented uh, measure concept. Uh, so the full name of the measure initially was maintaining floral species richness in natural meadows. And very quickly it was shortened into a flowering meadow. Uh, so the idea that uh, uh, biodiversity rich uh, meadows have a lot of uh, flowers and in the literature, you can find paper. I mean, it's known in France and even abroad as the flowering meadow measure. So initially, it was tested uh, only in uh, some uh, pilot area, which were uh, three natural regional parks in France. So the Bauge, uh, Vercors, and Haut-Jura uh, Park that tested the measure based on an idea that had been uh, experimented in Germany, actually. 
And then afterwards, because it was quite uh, successful and considered as interesting, it was then uh, exported, let's say, to other places uh, in France. And, um, and yeah, as I was telling you, it was a five-year contract uh, at that time between uh, the farmer and the state. Now it would be a, a region. So how did it work in practice? Uh, and this uh, goes to your question about how was set the, the target for biodiversity. Um, so in practice, the farmers uh, committed to ensure that there would be at least four plant species out of a list of indicator species with about 20, uh, 20 uh, plants, 20 flowers. So the farmer engagement was really at a plot level. So in, in the parcel for which he supplied the measure, he, he had to ensure that they were at, that he, he had at least four uh, plant species out of this uh, list, which you can see on the right of uh, indicative indicator species. Um, so, of course, there were uh, discussion about which uh, species we put in the list, and all the all the challenge was to find an agreement at local level about which indicator species do we put uh, in the list. And uh, the idea was uh, to support biodiversity-rich uh, meadows. So the chosen uh, species were supposed to be indicator of meadows with uh, high biodiversity. And um, there was also the issue of how to control uh, the measure and how to, uh, to make uh, the farmers uh, confident enough. So they chose a species with uh, easily recognizable uh, flowers. And, um, and at that time, when the, when the measure was uh, launched, uh, the, the indicative uh, list of species was elaborated at uh, local level. So there could be uh, a different list from uh, uh, one place to the other. Uh, so this the fact that the, um, the farmers engage in having at least four out of the 20 flowers in his uh, meadow is the result-oriented uh, aspect. He is free to uh, cut the grass when he wants, as long as uh, there is at least four out of the 20 species in the field. But they were also, if, we, if you look at the, uh, the measure in, uh, in, into more details, there were also two um, other uh, aspects the farmer committed to. The first one was having a fertilization limited to uh, 125 units of nitrogen per hectare and per year, with a maximum of 60 units of mineral fertilizer. And uh, the second one is that uh, chemical weeding and tillage were uh, forbidden. And actually, these are more action-oriented um, requirement. So very often the result-oriented measure actually combine both result-oriented and action-oriented requirement. But if there, if there is at least one result-oriented requirement, we generally call them result-oriented measure. Yes. Uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And uh, we will get back to this aspect when we talk about the um, uh, flowering meadow contest. Yeah. So it was biodiversity in a broad uh, sense, also services provided by, for biodiversity. 
So how uh, does it work in practice? And uh, it's getting back to your question, you raised very quickly the question of uh, control and controllability. So how did it work in practice? Uh, well, the, um, the criteria was uh, that the inspector in case of control, the state ins inspector had to find at least the four, at least four plants species in each third of the plot uh, diagonal, di diag diagonal, I don't know <laughs> the English pronunciation. So you have um, on the right, you can see the, the plot of a, our parcel, the, and over the red line, in each third of the red line, you had to find at least four of, of the 20 uh, plant species. And the particular aspect in France was that this measure, there was a zoning of the measure, meaning that uh, I told you it was uh, tested um, in uh, Ojura, Vercors, and Bauge Natural Regional Park at the beginning, but it was not um, possible to subscribe the measure for all the parcels there, but locally they had picked up some parcel of, uh, of some area of particular uh, interest and the measure could be subscribed only in those particular spots. It was something that was really questioned by the farmer because sometimes they, the farmer didn't really understand why they could uh, engage in the measure this parcel and not uh, their other meadow at the other side of their farm. But it was how uh, it was done in France and uh, therefore the farmers couldn't totally decide of the parcel they were um, engaging in the measure. So now uh, I propose to give you some feedback about how the farmers perceive such type of uh, measure. So I will um, rely for that on two research projects that we have had at ISARA on these uh, pilot measures. So the first one I will talk about was um, a European project involving several case study on the uh, Alpine art. And uh, we tried with this project to understand what are the farmers' motivation to subscribe to uh, agro-environmental measure and how do they perceive this result-oriented measure, which were supposed, I mean, policymakers designed them to be more adapted to uh, farmer constraints. So we checked with this project uh, whether uh, the farmers perceive them as such or not somehow. So we had uh, five regions of the Alps involved, uh, Vercors in France, and then a region in uh, Italy, in Switzerland, in uh, Germany, and in Austria. And uh, actually, the, the such result-oriented measure had been in place only in France and in Switzerland. So we interviewed uh, both farmer who had experience already with such measure and farmer who had actually no practical experience with uh, such result-oriented measure. So only 37% of the farmer we interviewed had this practical experience. Uh, so in the, um, in the project, um, we worked mainly with uh, farmers having uh, cow milk uh, production as ma main activities, but there were also some uh, other production uh, orientation in some farms. Uh, the medium size of the farm was uh, 46 hectares, and uh, they were located at an, alti at an altitude uh, varying from about 500 to uh, 1,800 meters. So what were, first of all, what were the farmers' motivation to subscribe to agri-environmental measure in general, be they action-oriented or result-oriented? What you can see on these uh, two graphs is that actually, so actually on the left hand side, you have, um, the question was, uh, is uh, the uh, economic interest an important motivation for you to subscribe? 
and then you have their answer per case study area. Uh, and on the right hand side, you have the question was, is the preservation of natural resources a motivation for you to subscribe to an agro-environmental measure? And what you, you can see is that uh, actually both the economic uh, and the environmental um, motivation had, uh, well, farmers were uh, motivated at more or less the same level by economic and by environmental um, aspect because we had 81 and 82% uh, of farmers that replied important to very important for both the economic aspect and the preservation of the environment aspect. So actually, both are quite uh, similar motivation. And uh, we had 70% uh, who stated uh, that one of their motivation is, uh, that one of their important motivation is the fact that uh, the measure recognizes the important and the importance and the role of mountain farming. So sometimes uh, you hear uh, that the farmers' motivation to subscribe to a agro environmental measure is mainly the economic incentives. What you can see here is actually that the protection of the environment was at the same level than the economic aspect. And then we ask them uh, how they, uh, whether they would prefer action-oriented measure or result-oriented measure. And what you can see is actually that there is uh, just a tiny majority that says, that declare that they would prefer result-oriented measure. So here on the graph, you have the result per case study, and the first line is the result uh, in general. So in general, on, the whole, on all the farmers, there were 58% that declared to be in favor of uh, result-oriented measure rather than action-oriented, uh, 27 preferred action-oriented, and um, 6 percent had uh, equal preferences, didn't really decide. So uh, it was quite a surprise for us because we, uh, we were actually expecting more farmers to be uh, in favor of result-oriented measures. So it's not so, it's not so clear. Actually, it's more, uh, the, the opinion are more diverse than what, than what we thought. And um, and the case of France and uh, Switzerland is quite uh, interesting because they were the two case studies where uh, result-oriented measure had already been implemented, and so the farmers already had some experience. And you can see that it's quite uh, the, the 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 opinion of the Swiss and the French farmer is very different. The Swiss farmer, 81 percent, declared to be in favor of. Uh, result-oriented measures, so they are quite fan of the approach. And in France, they are much more mitigated because we had only 40% of the farmers who declared um, to be in favor of result-oriented measure. And in the French farmer we interviewed, there were both farmers who had already uh, subscribed to result-oriented measure, and uh, there were farmers who had not subscribed to a result-oriented measure. And in the one who had subscribed, you, we had uh, seven or nine farmers, I don't remember who had subscribed, but anyway, we had the same, uh, um, more or less the same spread of the, the answer, meaning that even for those who had subscribed, they were not uh, saying that uh, there wasn't a major, uh, large majority saying we are in favor of result-oriented measure. So um, uh, then we tried to, uh, to uh, ask the farmers what was, uh, according to them, the difficulties related to the implementation of this uh, result-oriented measure. So they, have, uh, they came up with a lot of uh, answers about the difficulties they see. Here are just some of them. 
Um, first of all, the first, their first uh, worry was that they have no guarantee that they will actually reach the results. So they were a bit scared, some of them, to uh, subscribe to the measure because they were fearing that they would not manage to reach the, the expected uh, target, the expected result. The second fear uh, they reported was that uh, this would give them um, higher responsibility. And some of, some of them didn't really want to somehow take this responsibility. Uh, others reported that they were fearing if they would subscribe to such measure that the environmental, uh, the biodiversity uh, target would compete with their uh, production objective. So somehow they would uh, maybe tend to produce less. Um, some other reported that um, they considered that if, even if they uh, implement new farming practices on their meadows to try to have more diversity, the result uh, would be uh, unpredictable. So even if they change their farming practices, it's not sure that it will have an effect on the biodiversity in their field. Uh, some other reported that uh, it's difficult to control, so they were uh, fearing some problems in case of uh, control. And uh, some other uh, reported that they were not sufficiently trained and skilled about biodiversity to be able to assess themselves whether uh, they, have the, they have reached the target. And, um, and finally, some say that even if they uh, change farming practices, the time that will be necessary to have a concrete effect on the parcel is too long to, uh, to be relying on, uh, on subsidies. So somehow for them it was not really realistic uh, to have subsidies for, um, for results that would take such a long time to, uh, to appear. Uh, yes, but actually it's a five-year contract, so from the first year you are already supposed to have the results because you can be checked from the first year onwards. Okay. Yeah, yes, okay. every year of the contract, yeah, yeah. But what is happening? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, for all the agri-environmental measure, if you are, if you are not controlled, it's okay, you, I mean, but if you get controlled, uh, if the commitment is not respected, you have to give the money back, yes. Yeah or you can get a fine if it's just like with an action oriented measure if it's just a minor uh, problem you might have to give only part of the money back but yeah the idea is that you give the money back yeah so that's why it's a bit engaging for them yes and i will get back to that later but it had also probably an impact on the farmers who have uh, subscribed to the measure because uh, indeed, if they didn't have the, if they had a very low biodiversity level in their pasture, it's uh, really tricky to imagine that they will reach a much higher level within a year or even within five years. Yeah. 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 Uh, there was, but uh, that was really uh, depending on how the um, local institution uh, managed the measure. In many places, uh, they first advertised the measure to farmers that could uh, that had eligible uh, 
plots. And then there were um, advisor that could uh, do a kind of audit on the farm and uh, go with the farmers on the parcel and check with him, okay, this parcel for sure you have uh, much more biodiversity so you can subscribe without having any problems. But um, it was really organized by the advisory services, local advisory services. And could be different and can be different from one place to to another. Um, and then uh, these are just to show you some of the result of the uh, the other research project that we had on the measure at ISA, which was a DIVA project. And uh, this one was focused on France only. And uh, the farmers who were interviewed in this project, there were 39. They all had uh, subscribed to the to the measure. And what you can see uh, is that, so you have uh, on the graph the motivation uh, to subscribe to the flowering meadow measure. And what you can see that, again, you have the economic and the environmental uh, motivation that are two uh, really strong motivation. But you also have a third quite interesting aspect, which is the social recognition that farmer get and which appeared in this project as being uh, quite uh, an, quite important the figures are the number of farmers which have uh, mentioned uh, one or the other of the motivation and you can see that on the 39 there were 14 that quoted the three aspects uh, at the same time so this uh, social recognition was really something important and some farmers really were happy somehow about this measure because they, they considered uh, the measure as being a recognition of what they do for biodiversity and it really uh, for, them, for some of them changed the way they look at uh, their field and at their role of farmer. And uh, so it also, for some of them, really created uh, changes in the values they attribute to their work and to their role uh, in the society, actually. Like uh, being also recognized as a service provider and not only uh, as a production <laughs> provider of raw agricultural products. So, um, what can we learn from this um, from this research project? Um, and this is related to to, uh, to what you said. Actually, what was also shown in the second research project, the, the Diva one, is that the measure was mainly supporting pre-existing practices. Uh, because actually the farmers who subscribed to the measure were mainly farmers who already had a high level of biodiversity in their field. And uh, the one who had the lower biodiversity level, they, they very often didn't subscribe to the measure because they found it too risky to engage in the measure without knowing whether they would manage to reach uh, these uh, four plants out of 20. So, in fact, in the DIVA project, out of the 39 project, uh, farmers who were interviewed, there were only four who had implemented changes in their uh, practices in the meadows, and all the others, they subscribed to the measure, they didn't change anything, and, uh, and they got the, the, the money, of course. So there were uh, discussions in France as to whether uh, this is really um, uh, the role of agro-environmental measure. There was always a discussion. Should agro-environmental measure support environmental friendly uh, practices? In this case, it's totally fine to just support farmers who already have a high level of biodiversity. Or are agro-environmental measure meant to support farmers who accept to change to more environmental friendly practices. In this case, this is questionable because you give money to farmers who are already doing well. So there is still a debate ongoing on uh, this aspect. But what was um, uh, noticed is that uh, such measure can 
uh, discourage intensification. Sorry, there is a typing mistake. Uh, can, uh, can prevent somehow intensification on, of practices because we discussed it uh, in uh, the course of uh, Tuesday in uh, some uh, in some mountain area in France. What you see is that there is a tendency to intensify the farming practices to increase forage production on some parcel, for instance, with climate change, uh, the uh, production of hay uh, tends to decrease in some areas. So some farmers are tempted to uh, intensify a bit more. Um, so having such a measure can maybe prevent uh, intensification pattern and be a, an incentive to keep uh, extensive practice. And uh, what we could also learn from this uh, research project is that uh, the measure also enabled uh, to enable farmer to change their, uh, the way they see flowers and biodiversity on their farm. And this is uh, quite an interesting uh, out, output, I think, of the measure because uh, many farmers reported that they were they got actually really interested in biodiversity they were also uh, they also gained knowledge thanks to the exchange they had with local advisor and agronomists um, they they learned much more about the biodiversity they have uh, in their field so this is also Quite, uh, quite an interesting point because in the merit project, uh, we also got a lot of feedback from the farmers about, okay, I have uh, biodiversity in my field, but I don't know the plant. And actually I would like to know much more and to maybe be able to recognize them myself and to identify them myself. So you have a different farming. Uh -huh. So sometimes uh, one day you see there are some plants uh, Yeah, it's really nice. Actually, they're really demanding yeah. for uh, more information. Most of them, I would say. Yeah, most of them. Yeah. <laughs> really no. no. <laughs> but somehow, it's such type of measure created an occasion to have more exchanges between uh, stakeholders, farmers, and also environmentalists, or advisor, and really created an interest, I would say. And next to the measure itself, there were also actions which were implemented locally related to the uh, implementation of the measure. And that are, I think, quite interesting. So I will uh, now talk about the um, uh, flowering meadow contest or competition. So this uh, concours, uh, prairie, uh, concours prairie fleury. So this, um, this uh, contest that we tried in France is also an initiative that we copied from uh, Germany. Uh, and the purpose was really to analyze the, the, the rationale actually behind the contest was to have both um, a production uh, and a combined production and biodiversity approach. So the, the whole rationale is really to look at uh, the plots, not only uh, with the production objective, but also with the biodiversity objective. So the first uh, contest was organized in 2007 in the Bourges uh, Natural Regional Park. And then it was, and then the initiative was taken up by the, federa the National Federation of Natural Regional Park and Natural National Park uh, in partnership with INRA, which is the National Research Institute for Agronomy in France, uh, Scopella, which is um, uh, a very small agricultural advisor specialized in, uh, in um, pasture and meadows management in relation to uh, animal uh, feed. 
and uh, and then the national federation of chamber of agriculture which is the uh, the main uh, advisory body uh, let's say for farmers got involved as, as well and uh, nowadays there are some uh, some also cross border uh, contest for instance uh, with at the border in jura the border between uh, uh, france and switzerland and i think you told me that they were uh, trials also in Italy and here. Yeah, but we just really don't have any issues with Italy. And I think we'll come up to it because we have a few more things that we want to do. One was the Italian leader, but I think that's not there. So we did all that. So we did a farm in China, but we didn't have any participants. And also, we didn't have one of the best vegetable garden. And then one was a bit more participated, and so we put the other very long time just a menu box, so they did all the menu. It was done by the locality, the one we mentioned. Uh -huh. uh, it was about this, uh, this, uh, this photo, and also look at this point and it's about the menu to set the phone Yeah, if you would be in the jury for for sure the one with the artichoke would be. Um, and in 2014, um, this uh, uh, flowering meadow contest was officially recognized as being a Concours General Agricole, which is a recognition by the Ministry of Agriculture. And it was uh, very important for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, to have this uh, recognition because in France, usually the Concours Agricole, so those agricultural contests, they are really based on, they are really production oriented. So you have them for cows, for instance, and it's usually the most productive animals that are rewarded. So it was really, um, let's say, a change of mind to have this contest uh, recognized as an official concours agricole uh, why, uh, when it is meant to have both a farming and a production approach and an ecological approach, a biodiversity approach. So it was a kind of a small revolution <laughs> at that time. And now the, the contest still exists, but changed name. It's not called the Flowering Meadow Contest anymore, but uh, Agroecological practices contest for uh, meadows and uh, parcours. I don't remember how to translate it. It's uh, anywhere an area as well, uh, but it can be with trees and so on for animal to to graze. And uh, the change of uh, name is also related to the fact that um, we had a, a big uh, national plan for the development of uh, agroecology. So to have more agroecological practices in, uh, in farming system in France. So it was somehow a way to make the contest uh, fit into this uh, agroecological plan for France. So how does it work? The contest is also, as you said, uh, very locally based. So each uh, area in France can decide to do the contest or not. And then uh, when, it, when, for instance, the Natural Regional Park of Vercor uh, decides to run the contest, uh, any farmers having livestock keeping can participate. And uh, it's each uh, farmer that uh, decide which parcel he proposes for the contest. And of course, uh, each farmer can decide to participate or not. It's on voluntary, uh, uh, voluntary basis. And, um, and the plots which are involved in the contest 
uh, must be a productive one. I mean, they must be used in the farm for, this, for the animals. And then all the parcels which are proposed, uh, which run for the contest, are visited by a local jury. And, uh, and then uh, it starts with the presentation of the plot by the farmer himself or herself, who explain uh, a bit the history of the plot and uh, what it is uh, used for, how it is used for, how it is used, when do the animals go, for instance, if the animals go. Uh, what about the local jury? Uh, so the jury is composed of a diversity of stakeholders and it's also, that's also one of the really important aspects because they are both uh, agronomists and environmentalists. For instance, it can be a bird expert uh, through a local bird life organization. I'm sure you have those in Italy as well. In France, they are called the Ligue de Protection des Oiseaux. Uh, there is also usually one beekeeper or a beekeeping expert in the jury because as you uh, mentioned, the flowers are also important for pollinators and for bees and they are really willing to take that into account uh, when evaluating the, the plots. And also, usually there is also uh, a farmer to bring uh, like the farmer uh, perspective and not to have a too <laughs> top-down approach with a jury of experts evaluating the work of the poor farmer. <laughs> so I think it's really important to have at least one farmer in the jury as well, to be on a level playing field somehow. Um, and then the, the, the really important aspect is to get all those stakeholders to discuss together and, uh, and the purpose is also that each of them can uh, maybe change a bit his mind and broaden his, pers his perspective. For instance, the environmentalist to, con to consider uh, the farmer's perspective or the agronomist's perspective and vice versa. The agronomist to maybe consider that, okay, this is important for bees or for birds, uh, etc. Yeah. Uh, it is for the contest, for the competition, but uh, it is somehow linked because the contest was created in area that uh, had implemented the measure. So it was kind of side action next to the measure. And I will get back to that later, but uh, in the research project, the DIVA research project, we find out that uh, actually the contest is maybe more important than the measure itself. Because this really, this really, the measure is just okay, you subscribe to a measure, you get the money and you get a discussion with the agricultural advisor. But here through the contest, there is really the opportunity to have discussion between the different stakeholders and to make people uh, change their mind, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 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 yeah, they they don't really correct the the practice. They uh, they yeah somehow they judge that they, they evaluate uh, each of the proposed plot, each of the plots which are running for the contest. There is an evaluation by the jury according to different criteria. I will just go to yeah yeah, but then it's up to the farmer to then correct his practices if he wants to, but he doesn't have to. It's just a contest to, to reward the best uh, meadows of the area. And uh, then it's also an occasion for discussing about uh, farming practices and their impact on biodiversity. Because when the jury is uh, here, you have on the picture, this was the farmer, this was the owner of the parcel, 
So because he's there when the jury uh, comes, it's also an opportunity to, uh, to have discussion and for him to learn and to hear what the environmentalists uh, say about the parcel. And this can lead him to change practices in the future, maybe. But it's not mandatory to change. You can just participate one year to the, to the contest and then continue as before. And here again, uh, the, the plot evaluation is really based on the same principle as for the measure, actually. So the jury goes uh, uh, through this uh, diagonal <laughs> um, and um, in a line, not to destroy <laughs> totally the, the pasture, the meadow. And uh, on each of the third, uh, they check that there is at least, uh, there are at least four out of the 20 uh, plant species. But they also evaluate uh, other things. So this is the current um, evaluation uh, grid. So there are a number of uh, templates, let's say, that uh, need to be filled in during the, uh, the evaluation. But the rationale behind the evaluation remain the same since uh, the creation. So it still remains, the main objective remains to assess both the farming, so the production aspect, but also the ecological and the biodiversity aspect. So I will just give you uh, some examples of uh, the, um, the grid to be filled in is really long and it's 12 pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there are a lot of different aspects, but here I just, uh, I have just put on the left examples that are more related to the, the, the assessment of the farming aspect and on the right, more, let's say the ecological aspect of the, um, of the plot. So here you have, for instance, things related to the productivity of the parcel, because the, the aim is not to have flour, but not producing anything. And uh, here it is about uh, the um, feed value. So um, is it, uh, is it uh, good <laughs> uh, for the feed uh, ration or, or not? Here is about um, ecological, uh, ecological aspects. So for instance, the diversity present in the, in the plot, uh, the quality for the fauna, um, yeah, so related to uh, ecological, the ecological functions and services provided by the parcel. And here it is the valor apical, so value for uh, bees and pollinators and beekeeping, the beekeeping aspect. But there are overlap field evaluations. Yes. No. No, no, it's really just uh, uh, this. <laughs> so the jury going, uh, observing first the parcel, because there are also landscape uh, aspects that are taken into account, and then crossing the field and just having a look and counting more or less, uh, spotting this and that uh, species, but uh, that's it, no lab analysis. Yeah, and then, um, yeah, from green to, to red to, quali to, to give some qualitative uh, evaluation. And then, um, so they are at, uh, at local level, three uh, winning plots, first, second, and uh, third. And uh, in, in this uh, part is, the, is how the final mark is calculated. Uh, so here again with ecological and agroecological uh, aspect and more uh, aspects related to the use in farming and in uh, feeding uh, the herd and uh, the total, which is this, um, this question of equilibrium between production objective and biodiversity objective. 
And then, because now the contest is being run in many places in France, so then each of the local winners uh, run for a national contest, uh, working with the same uh, evaluation uh, model. And, um, and then they are the national winners and the reward, like uh, we call them prix in French, the reward are given to the winning plots and winning uh, farmers at the at Paris uh, International Fair for Agriculture, which is a very important event for the farming sector, and which is taking place uh, once a year in Paris. Um, in Paris. So there are really now communication around uh, around that. So in conclusion, we can say that actually it's what I was telling you next to, to the measure itself, which is this uh, contract and this payment for five years, the, the action which have been put in place locally next to the measure are really important, maybe, maybe sometimes more important in terms of learning for the farmers than the measure itself. And uh, there were uh, really uh, interesting dynamics that were created locally with, for instance, this contest or with the advisory action that have been put in place locally to promote the measure. And uh, this has uh, really uh, changed uh, the point of view of some farmers on biodiversity. Uh, then some farmers have really explained that they have changed their point of view and they used to see this biodiversity objective of the measure as an ob obligatory requirement and now they see also biodiversity as an asset for their farm uh, also because there are discussion about what the flora can bring uh, for the animals in the feed ration also sometimes on health related issues for the animals on taste of the final product etc and it really created a connection between, diff, uh, between uh, stakeholders from different fields, like agronomists, environmentalists, beekeeper, bird expert, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, somehow we can say that it's um, a concrete example of uh, how to implement the concept of ecosystem services, because here, uh, through the contest, you got uh, interesting discussion about the, the services uh, provided by uh, farmers to society and, uh, and the services uh, provided by this uh, biodiversity in meadows. Uh, so this uh, pilot measure was, as I told you, tested in uh, 2007 in uh, three places in France. Then it was extended to uh, more places. And um, in 2014, we changed uh, cap programming period, as we say. So we had a new uh, cap uh, framework. And this measure that I, um, I presented was kept but a slightly modified. And uh, the rationale for this modification was to go from a plot level approach, because as I was explaining you, all the um, farmers, they were engaging some parcel, uh, some parcel only. They didn't have to engage the whole farm in the, in the measure. Uh, so the, the, the change that was made for this 2014-2020 uh, programming period was to go from a plot approach to a farm level approach. So in practice, uh, this uh, measure that was in place uh, from 2014 onwards was called Mesure uh, environmentale et climatique. Uh, système herbagé et pastoraux. And uh, it's in French, we call it uh, system measure, meaning that the measure targets uh, changes at system level and not only at uh, plot level. So here are the requirements of the measure. So as you can see, um, the, um, the requirement that remains the same is uh, the last one, sorry, 
so having certain parcel with this uh, result objective measure of having at least four out of the four species out of the list present in the parcel, but next to this uh, requirement, there were um, all the other requirements that uh, concerned the whole farm. Okay, so this is the main difference. So at farm level, you needed to have a maximum stocking rate. Uh, you are not allowed to plow any of your permanent pasture. You are not to allowed to use pesticide of any of your permanent pasture. And it was forbidden to destroy any of the ecological focused area, which are uh, the hedges, the isolated trees and etc. So next to the requirement at uh, plot level, you also had to to engage, to respect a number of things at farm level. And there were also some extra eligibility criteria. So not all the farms could engage in the measure. You needed to have at least 70% of your uh, uh, farming area into grassland and you needed to have a minimum number of uh, animal on the farm. And this was meant to avoid that uh, arable um, farm would uh, subscribe to a measure that is meant for mountain farms, actually, or with, for farms with uh, not only mountains, but uh, quite a lot of mountain farms, or farms in plain, but with a really high proportion of grassland. So this is just to uh, summarize the, these changes. Ah, but you don't see the color. <laughs> so, so it's kind of useless. But anyway, so they are supposed to be color on this figure. Um, and it was just to illustrate that before you could actually engage only one of your parcel in the measure and not care about uh, and not care or not having to justify what you were doing on the on the other plots. And now with that uh, renewed approach, uh, you had to respect uh, things on your biodiversity rich parcel, but also you, this also had consequences on your management of uh, uh, permanent grassland and uh, ecological um, element. So actually, um, it has an impact on uh, almost uh, the whole farm, not totally the whole, like uh, if you have uh, crops, they, it had no impact on the crop plots, but for the rest, uh, all the permanent grasslands, for instance, were, uh, had to stay per, uh, gra permanent grassland, etc., etc. So what are the, um, what can we, keep from this in terms of uh, recommendation for future uh, policies. Actually, I think that this um, change is from a plot, plot approach to a farm approach is, um, is more interesting from an environmental point of view, because as I was telling you in the first version of the measure, uh, farmers could uh, were really free to do whatever practices on the rest of the parcel and now they are more committed to have a system thinking at the level of the farm. But still, um, I think we will probably in the future need to have an even broader approach. And uh, here it is just to, uh, to illustrate the fact that at the moment, okay, we got from the plot level to the farm level, but I think that we probably have to go up to the supply chain level also for this agro-environmental uh, uh, action or uh, to the territorial level. And uh, I, uh, um, I used um, for this uh, figure the work that was done by uh, Alice Berthe, which was uh, one of our PhD students who just uh, graduated and defended her thesis last week. And uh, she, uh, she didn't work on mountain farming, she worked on water quality issue. But I think that the approach that she has uh, used is a very interesting one. 
she used the concept of uh, policy mix, which is a concept um, to analyze the implementation of uh, policies. Uh, and she used it for agro-environmental policy. And the rationale is that uh, to be totally um, efficient, you should actually combine different type of, uh, of measures. And in her work, she worked on water quality issues and uh, she showed that uh, uh, at the moment, local stakeholders are more and more um, combining different uh, policy tools and agro-environmental tools and that you have actually to go up to the supply chain level for the changes to be really sustainable. Uh, what does it mean in practice? It's if the farmer makes changes at the scale of his plot or at the scale of his farm, but if it is not somehow uh, also recognized by the supply chain stakeholders, such as the processor uh, collecting the raw product from the farm or processing them, uh, well, the farmers might, might not uh, be able to maintain those environmental efforts on the long run. So there is really an issue to also get the supply chain stakeholder involved and maybe to get even a recognition at product level for the effort made by the farmer at, uh, at farm level. So I think that uh, we saw with the flowering meadow measure that we already made a step forward with getting from the plot to the farm approach, but there is probably a need to even go further and consider a supply chain aspect and the supply chain level, which is really impacting on what is going on at the farm. And also the territorial level to better um, make the local area benefit from uh, dynamic at, uh, dynamics at, um, at farm level. And of course, uh, like um, areas corresponding to natural processes such as a watershed or a natural regional park or uh, another type of protected area is also an important scale to design and implement um, agri-environmental uh, policies. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, in well, on Tuesday we have talked about um, uh, quality schemes such as uh, uh, protected designation of origin, for instance. Those are um, schemes that can help the farmer to get a better added value, but it's not uh, the case everywhere. I mean, not every area has a PDO, and uh, the PDO, some PDO are doing really well in rewarding better the farmers. Some are not doing that well in, re in rewarding the farmers. So I think that, yes, we have to, that the supply chain uh, have to also play a role to uh, give incentive to farmers to have more environmental uh, friendly practices. And, uh, and somehow the, the price of the product and the price paid to farmers for the agricultural product should also reward those who, uh, who have uh, favorable practices. Because indeed, I mean, public policies um, like uh, the agro-environmental policy, they are nice to help farmers to change. But as I told you, it's a five-year contract. So what happened after the five years? Uh, they are not meant to be a permanent support in theory. 
I mean, you you can uh, you can discuss that. Huh? I told you we already had this discussion about how the diagram environmental measurement to maintain certain practices or to help farmer changing practices. But um, on the long, ideally, I think the farmer should be rewarded um, for the such services provided without having to apply for. Uh, policy support, I would say. Um, the farmers, we, we met because we worked in the, mainly in the Vercor uh, Natural Regional Park. Uh, there, there is one uh, PDO, which is doing pretty well. And um, several of the farm, not all of the farmers were involved in the PDO. There were also farmers doing direct sales. They were getting quite a reasonable price for their product. But uh, nevertheless, I think those farmers have really extensive practices. They are in mountain areas, so they have higher production costs and so on. So as I was telling you, for some of them, the, the measure was quite an important incentive not to um, intensify or uh, in some area not to abandon some of the pasture, which can be uh, biodiversity, uh, rich but uh, low production level so so yeah i mean these policies are useful uh, if the market doesn't provide a sufficient re reward for for such practices you're welcome um so yes, just a few words of uh, conclusion. What we can say is that these result-oriented measures are somehow an, an innovative approach because uh, compared to the action-oriented measure, they give more flexibility to farmers and uh, somehow they are um, more adapted to farmer constraints. They also give them more responsibility. Uh, some farmers really reported to feel more responsible, not only for production, but also for nature protection. And uh, it can also be uh, uh, stimulating for farmers to try uh, to, to question whether they can reach a higher level of biodiversity. What we also saw, and I think it's a really important learning from, this, uh, from both the measure and the contest, is that it really created the changes in the values uh, of some farmers and really changes also their view on, uh, on biodiversity. And, um, and one of the limits maybe is that the, as we saw, the measure mainly contributed to maintaining existing practices than actually getting farmer to change their uh, their practices. So it was rather maintenance than uh, an incentive for uh, intensive farmers to go to more extensive practices. This uh, we didn't really see happening. But the big Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But there is always this discussion about what should be the purpose of agro-environmental measure. Is it for uh, creating or fostering changes or is it for uh, supporting existing practices? And, uh, and you're right, actually, both are, um, can, it can be, it can, they can have the two objectives, actually. 
it's true that uh, farmers doing well <laughs> deserve uh, also a reward and uh, and can be an incentive for them to maintain because if those farms disappear we will end up having problem as well so yeah you can see uh, uh, you can see a grand environmental measure as a tool both for maintaining and for uh, accompanying for change. But let's say that this measure was mainly in practice for maintaining and didn't create so much changes in, um, in practices. And, um, and as I was telling you, I think that because in terms of policy evaluation, most of the time, uh, the efficiency of a policy is um, is uh, evaluated on indicators such as number of uh, farmers or number of hectares that were involved in the measure and so on, so on very quantitative uh, term. And I think that here the success of the measure is also very much related to some of the qualitative aspects that we uh, have talked about and uh, that are not easily measurable, actually. Um, and there was a lot of success in the dynamics that were created uh, at local level and all these exchanges between different stakeholders, such as environment uh, stakeholder and farming stakeholder, which uh, uh, sometimes <laughs> um, do not really understand each other easily, let's say, and there, the, it really created the room for uh, discussion and uh, and I think it's a, a really important um, and a really important uh, aspect especially nowadays where environment is sometimes a, a source of uh, tension so that was um, what I wanted to to tell you if there are questions or remarks, I'm happy to answer them and to discuss uh, with you. Otherwise, I, I also just wanted, uh, Valeria, if it's still uh, okay time-wise, to say a few words, but we can open the discussion first and then uh, I wanted to tell you a few words about the mountain module we have at ISARA in case one of you would be interested for uh, coming to France. <laughs> Uh, we are uh, planning with Unimont to sign an uh, agreement to try to foster a student exchange between our two institutions. So the mountain module is one of the modules that is in English and that could be of interest for you. But should I do it now? Or? Okay, so we have a small module which is called Mountains as a Challenging Area, which is a, a small module, three weeks only. It's not nothing compared to the three-year or the two-year program here. Um, but it's fully dedicated to the issue of mountains. It is given for us in the fourth year of our study program, which is equivalent to a first year of master. And uh, the rationale really is that mountains shouldn't be seen as a, a handicapped area or less favored area as it is written, often written in uh, policy text, but uh, that we should look at them as being a center for innovation and as a challenging area, but on a, on a positive, um, on a positive uh, aspect. So the main objective of the module is to get students to understand the characteristics and the specificities of mountains, to analyze uh, the strategies of local stakeholder, a bit as we did yesterday during the excursion, to also know the main policies that are in place and that can be implemented in mountains, and to uh, train students to develop a prospective vision about the challenges to be faced in mountains in the future and the, um, the action that can be implemented to uh, face those challenges. So during the module we have lectures from uh, uh, different uh, researcher, professor from uh, different EU countries, so the perspective is really EU-wide uh, with some focus on different uh, countries in Europe through the 
the uh, cost is given by these different uh, stakeholders. And next to the, the academic world, we also have some uh, professional uh, people who come. Uh, so stakeholders working in mountains or on mountains. Uh, we have a, a study trip, a three-day study trip, because unfortunately we are based in Lyon, not based in the mountains as you. <laughs> Um, and during this uh, case study trip, we try to meet different type of stakeholders to get a better understanding of who is doing what and how stakeholders can work together. We do also a landscape analysis, as you can see on the picture on the right, uh, to try to also understand what we can, uh, by looking at the landscape, understand about uh, the way uh, local communities are organized, what are their constraints, and so on. And then there is a group work to be done based on the study trip. Uh, so each group has to work on a topic related to the case study analysis, it can be tourism, sustainable tourism, uh, quality product valorization, uh, protected area, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and just uh, to give you a few examples about the issue we discussed during the module, uh, we discuss uh, the relation between landscape, agriculture, and uh, tourism. For instance, on the left picture, you see trees and uh, the agricultural field that are starting to close, we say in France, because forest is starting to grow again because the uh, because of changes in, uh, in farming practices, probably uh, less grazing, etc. Uh, on the right picture, we can see the impact of the ski uh, resort uh, facilities on the landscape. So we discuss uh, such kind of things. We also uh, discuss the question of coexistence between wild flora, wild fauna, sorry, um, uh, pastoralism and uh, tourism. In France, we have uh, for a couple of years now the wolf. Uh, it's a big debate in France, a main source of conflict because we didn't have wolf for some decades. So now that they are back, everybody. <laughs> okay. But. Uh huh. Uh, a dead. Uh, Municipal, uh, but they do the same in France. <laughs> Sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, in France, everybody thinks that in Italy, the coexistence is peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody always say, but in Italy, they manage, so we should manage. Nobody knows that there are conflicts in Italy as well. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, protection measures, uh, such as uh, protection dogs and so on, which create sometimes tension and problem with the tourists. Some get uh, uh, dog bites <laughs> and, uh, and create problems. So we discuss all of this. And of course, we also discuss the question of how to uh, promote quality product and which strategy can be set up at local level to try to get more uh, added value for mountain products. So the module is taking place in June uh, every year. And, um, and if you are interested about uh, coming for a semester in France, it should be possible in the upcoming uh, years. Uh, for, next, for this year, it's actually before 15 of October. So I think it's <laughs> over. So for doing this, uh, you can go to uh, the Oslo Trainship, uh, what we call it from the investors, uh, or you can do it in the business uh, from, uh, I think, five or six months or something like that. But you have to really be careful uh, about uh, the, um, the data that is presented then. So there are every six months, uh, there is uh, yeah, yeah, a... Right. 
But what, uh, what I can say, but, but, uh, if you want to come for courses, uh, there are two options. One is the fall semester, so it starts uh, mid-September. Uh, and the second one is from January or February onwards. And uh, if you go for this uh, spring uh, uh, semester, uh, the spring semester is organized in a small module of two or three weeks and at each period there is at least one in English so if you decide to come you would be able to follow only English program from February until uh, June and the mountain module would be one of them and there would be other module in English on other topics. So I brought some flyers so that you can uh, check if you are interested the course that are uh, that would be available either for the fall or the spring semester. And the second flyer are about summer school in case you are interested rather for summer school, which is a much uh, shorter program. So don't hesitate to uh, contact us, Unimont and, uh, and then me if you are interested so that we can find uh, uh, and tell you more about the possibilities. And ISARA is part of a consortium of three uh, schools. Uh, or, yeah, like ISARA, there are two other similar ones. Uh, so you can also check on the flyer what the other two offer, both for the summer school and for the regular classes, let's say. So don't hesitate to <laughs> take the flyer. And I will also leave them so for those who are online, you can get one later if you're interested. And meanwhile, I'm happy to discuss with you about the presentation if you have questions or reactions, or uh, if you want to discuss about the, uh, the excursion of yesterday and the report you might write. Mm -hmm. I'm also available later if you want. There is a question online.
Yeah, so very, very uh, important questions online uh, on the fact that in Italy, um, a lot of farmers find this, uh, uh, this measure from the rural development program uh, difficult and uh, not easily accessible. Actually, uh, we hear the same uh, criticism in France. Um, we also had uh, a lot of delay in the payment of this agri-environmental measure in uh, 2015, 2016, 2017. There were up to five years delay in some places for the payment, and this was a very, very bad signal sent to the farmers. They were, they are farmers who have subscribed to such agro-environmental measure in the past, and um, and who don't, who do not want to um, to subscribe, who say that I don't want to subscribe to such measure anymore. So, uh, yeah, I agree that uh, it is really. Um, it's really not easy. Uh, some farmers also consider that if they subscribe to such measure, they are more likely to get control for the common agricultural policy payment. And that can also be um, a reason for them not to, uh, not to, um, not, not to subscribe. And, um, and I would say that the result-oriented measure maybe seem uh, to be um, less complicated than the action-oriented one because they give uh, farmers more flexibility. For instance, the discussion we had on the late mowing uh, measure, which uh, might not be adapted uh, to the weather condition of a particular year, uh, with a result-oriented measure, you have more flexibility but what we saw in the results is that uh, farmers do not uh, <laughs> um, all consider that uh, it's actually better with result-oriented measure. And some of them are also uh, a bit scared of such, um, of such measure. I, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't really have a, an answer to what to do. I think trying to reduce bureaucracy is for sure one aspect a lot of farmers are really scared about bureaucracy but at the same time uh, when you get uh, public money you have to justify why you get this public money so i don't think we can totally stop the bureaucracy and the control either but maybe to try to make it um, less heavy in terms of um, of bureaucracy could be one option and uh, then the question, the question was also about the measure for uh, um, supporting um, animals uh, and, uh, and breed uh, in, uh, in danger of abandonment. I'm not a specialist of this measure. I think that they also exist in France. But I must say, I never worked on those and I, I don't, uh, I don't really know how they work, but for sure uh, they are not uh, sufficient because all the farmers I know uh, having um, breeds uh, which are in danger of uh, abandonment do it rather for person because they have per strong personal motivation about that than uh, because they expect to get a financial uh, reward. Yeah, so here again, it would be more 
uh, it would not be an incentive to change, but rather a support for farmers already involved in maintaining those um, those breed. <laughs> So on the on the question of how to get more farmers involved in the in the policy measure, I I I don't have a, like a, an already a recipe. I think that a lot of farmers are scared about the bureaucracy and the risk in 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 case of control, um, and maybe this gets back to the discussion we had earlier. Uh, if the policy do not uh, sufficiently um, give incentive for farmers to get for to go for those measures, the other option could be the market and to have a better price for product coming from farms having more sustainable practices. But here again, uh, we see that uh, such uh, price premium for product is. Um, is not easy to, to access. It's either through direct selling, if you have customer who accept to pay for such practices, or through quality schemes such as PDO, organic farming, etc. But uh, here again, it really takes a long time to get the farmers to know the label. And, um, and it also relies on the fact that you have consumer who are willing and ready to pay to pay a higher price for those uh, for those products, but there is probably a kind of equilibrium to find between market and the price of the product and what uh, policy can uh, can do. Okay, thanks, <laughs> and sorry for not having <laughs> a, a miracle recipe. <laughs> Other question or reaction or no? So thanks to all for your attention and uh, have a good evening. And it was really a pleasure for me to be here. And I want to thank once again Unimon for having given me the opportunity to to come.